Good morning. My name is Noah Silverman. I'm with the UCLA Department of Statistics, and I also operate my own consulting firm at smartmediacorp.com. Today we're going to talk a little bit about horse race modeling, specifically modeling the probability of horses winning a race. This poses an interesting question in the world of statistics as well as economics and finance, as you can really see a race as a microcosm for a stock market or any other type of scenario where there are multiple people with different opinions all trying to uh, bet or invest on an outcome. I chose to look at horse racing in Hong Kong, as many other academics have. Uh, it's a small, tight race field. There are only two tracks and about 1,500 horses that race every year. So the data is very, very consistent and easy to analyze from year to year. I wrote software to scrape 3,681 races from the Hong Kong Jockey Club that took place between 2007 and 2011. Uh, I experimented with two forms of holdout data for testing, uh, a random cross validation of 20%, and uh, the last 737 races of the series, which uh, is approximately the year 2012. Now, screen's a little high, forgive me. In horse racing, we don't want the probability of a horse winning a race, we want the probability of a horse winning a race relative to the other horses he's racing with. In other words, the probabilities for each race need to sum to one. Uh, the form of math that we use for that is something called a conditional logistic regression. A normal logistic regression is simply the probability of the event, and that's easy enough to calculate. We know how to do that. Uh, conditional logistic regression is also fairly simple. It's a logistic regression with the condition that the probability sum to one. Uh, as you can see in the first equation there, that is the uh, conditional probability. It's the uh, e to the power of your linear combination for the winning horse over the sum of all the other horse's powers. Uh, the likelihood is right below it, and then to make the math work and cleaner, we tend to work with the log likelihood, which gives the third equation there. Now, this is an easy enough problem, and you can solve this with plenty of off-the-shelf software. The problem is there's a curse of dimensionality. Just working with some basic factors of the race, I have 186 variables, and I'm sure other people have many more. Uh, if you want to look at the quadratic expansion of each of those variables, you get up to 372. If you want to look at every possible two-way interaction to see what might be significant, you're now at 34,596 variables. There is no off-the-shelf software that's going to fit that. Uh, the other thing we want to look at is uh, what variables are significant. Obviously, with too many variables, uh, the problem becomes wide, not tall, and uh, as you know, a lot of regression stuff doesn't work. Uh, to do that, I like to implement what's called a lasso. Uh, which puts a penalty factor as the second part of the equation, the lambda times the sum of betas, uh, and basically you tune that penalty factor and it uh, will push the less significant coefficients towards zero. Uh, and, what, and what's done in practice is that we tune that uh, and test or look at our holdout data set or simulate a betting run or something like that, and somewhere, it's a curve, it's convex, we'll find an optimal tuning parameter that maximizes our goal. In this case, it would be profit, but it could be anything. Uh, and then given that tuning parameter, any coefficient that's zero or close to zero, we can just drop out of the model. So in a sense, the model will tell us what coefficients are good. We can throw everything with the kitchen sink in there and get good model results back. Another uh, innovation I introduced to this type of modeling is the concept of frailty. Interestingly, in uh, there's another model used in medicine called the Cox Proportional Hazards Model, which has to do with the probability of somebody dying or contracting a disease compared to the other survivors. It has the exact same mathematical formulation as a conditional logistic regression. Uh, a mathematician or statistician named Gillick in 2001 proposed a concept of a frailty. And the idea is fairly simple. Not everybody in the, you know, when you're studying people in disease in medicine, not everybody is as strong. Some people are more frail or more likely to contract a disease. Uh, so you add a weighting factor to them so you're not treating everybody the same, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, because if you think about it, especially with the model, we're trying to fit coefficients, but the coefficients apply equally across all cases. Here we're allowing a case weight to exist as well. 
Now, in horse racing, we have one really interesting piece of information, which are the odds on the token board. Odds, contrary to what a lot of naive people think, have nothing to do with the probability of the horse winning. All it tells you is how much of the pool of money you'll get, what your piece of the pie will be if that horse wins. Now, you can convert that into a percentage, and people frequently refer to that thinking those, that represents the horse's chance of winning, and that's not true at all. I like to think of it as the public's sort of group think uh, best guess, or the, you know, the public's implied probability of the horse winning, in a sense that the more money the public bets on a horse, the more confident the public is on a horse, the lower the odds, the higher the percentage. So there is information there. There tends to be a 35 to 40% correlation between the public's favorite and the horses that win. So the public's not completely naive, and we should use that. So if you look at the equation here on the bottom, what I've done is take the likelihood formula, and I've added in the frailty parameter in the same way Gillick would have done it. But in this case, it's not really frailty, it's strength. And that's a parameter represented by the public's confidence in the horse. So we're, in effect, taking our coefficients and covariates, all 34,000 of them if we're doing all the interactions, and we're taking the public's weight of the opinion of how that horse should be, and, and we're combining them in a way. Now, solving this, as you can imagine, is not easy. 34,000 dimensions, or let's just go back to the 186. That's enough you're going to break any of your software. Uh, the way to do this is something called cyclical coordinate descent. In a sense, what you do is you fit your model, take the derivative of it with respect to one of the coefficients, one out of 186, and then you take the second derivative of that. And what you can do is a little tiny Newton step that moves that one coefficient forward towards its optimal value. You fix that, and then you go to coefficient two, do the same process. Fix that, go to coefficient three, do the same process. So you wind up taking these little tiny zigzag steps towards your convex optim optimal. The, the graph here sort of demonstrates that. You'll see if, if on a two-dimensional plane with two variables, you can see the path sort of zigzags its way through. Uh, and, and you'll reach, at some point, it never converges perfectly, but you'll reach some point where the change in your likelihood function is so small, you're basically there. And doing that lets us fit an arbitrarily large number of covariates in a computational fashion that's not unrealistic and won't break software. Here's a really brief uh, outline of the algorithm. Uh, if anybody wants the slides for this, I can email it to them. It will make it easier to understand. But you're basically calculating what's called the tentative step uh, because the structure of this likelihood function and the derivatives, we don't know if you want to step up or down, positive or negative for a given coefficient when we start. So we tend to do a lot of sort of if-then steps and a minimax, and we have a, we have a bound so that we don't take steps that are too big, and we tend to compress the bound as we get closer. And these are all things for efficiency, but it's basically the idea of doing the cyclical coordinate descent. Now, if you remember early on, let me just roll back to that slide, we introduced lambda here, which is the weighting parameter on the um, on the coefficients, it's a penalty in a sense. So it will squeeze the non or the uh, insignificant coefficients will get squeezed closer to zero. Now the problem with that is there's no closed form solution for lambda. It can't be done. So now we have to do this whole coordinate descent thing, which can take a lot of time, for every single value of lambda we want to test. And really, you just have to do a grid search and iterate through lots of values of lambda to find the best one. So you're repeating this thing lots of times, and it's really, really slow. Uh, you know, one round of coordinate descent can take, I think on my desktop Mac, it took six hours or eight hours. So now if I want to test 50 values of lambda, you know, I'm looking at hundreds of hours of computing time, and, and what if I want to change the model and do it? It's just not practical. So the solution for this is parallelization. Most of the fitting in cyclical coordinate descent is a combination of transformations and reductions. And, and I don't want to go too far down that tangent in this talk, but it may be something I'll address in the future, and there's tons of material online for this. But the idea, think about uh, mean squared error. You have your value, your y, you have your estimation, y hat, you take the difference, you square it, and you sum them up. Well, there's no reason that you can't take the difference and the squares of the differences in parallel. Uh, so it becomes one big parallel step or two big parallel steps and then sum up the results. And while that's a trivial example, it saves you a ton of time when you have to start doing exponents of 
long vectors of values or square roots of long vectors of values. It's really a time saver. The best way to do that these days, uh, there's two ways. There's OpenMP, and that will run on a multi-core CPU. So it'll run on your laptop, your desktop, whatever. And you know, most CPUs now have four cores or eight cores or something like that. And you'll see a nice speed bump. Uh, and it's fairly simple to implement. The only problem is, again, R won't do it off the shelf, and MATLAB won't do it off the shelf for this kind of cyclical coordinate descent. You kind of have to bake your own. Uh, I wrote something in C++, and in C++, the OpenMP libraries are trivial. You just plug them in, add maybe a half a dozen lines of code that are hints to the compiler, and boom, you're in parallel, and you'll see a huge speed up. The even better way to do it is something called CUDA. As many of you are aware now, the graphics processor card of your computer, what's known as the GPU, graphics processing unit, is really several hundred cores or several hundred processors working in parallel. And they're all relatively dumb. They don't do lots of fancy things like your CPU does, but we can harness that. And there's a massive revolution going on. Again, tons of stuff online, massive revolution about how to parallelize things. And again, you write this in C++, you plug into the CUDA libraries, you have to rework some of the processes, and again, not the point of this talk, but doing in CUDA gives you a massive speed up, like it saves tons of time. Uh, here's a quick plot, and you can see uh, the dash line at the bottom is the speed I uh, spent for CUDA for the loop, you know, 500 milliseconds. Running this on one core in my you know, PC, which would be the normal way, is 4,000 milliseconds. So there's an eight times speed up using CUDA. And you can see the dash line as I go down OpenMP, you know, running eight cores, I'm running at about 1,500 milliseconds, uh, which is three times slower than CUDA, but it's not bad. But that also cripples my computer and I can't do anything else. Uh, so it is worth paralyzing for these kinds of problems. You know, I have this idea that ultimately, why not generate 50,000 or 100,000 variables or multiples of models and do some more advanced things with regularization that I'm not gonna get into today and squeeze it all and, and let the math and the model tell us really what are the best covariates to predict the outcome of these complex noisy events. Uh, and then we have to do that in parallel. There's no way. Now, here's an interesting plot. I calculated uh, return on investment over our, our holdout period of one year from 2012 for betting, or simulated betting, I should say. And I tune Lambda. And it's a little bit of a noisy process because you know, this is a really noisy domain and the best horse in the world might actually lose. And so it's not a perfect fit, but you can see that there's a nice, you know, there's definitely a slope here. Uh, the higher values of Lambda, if we get up to, you know, 80 and 100, uh, the return on investment's really, really low. Uh, and for comparison, I should have mentioned this earlier, the uh, sort of groundbreaking work in this was by, by a guy named Bill Benter, who's one of the most famous horse gamblers in the world and has it's rumor generated about 500 million in profit, and he was doing some logistic regression and some multinomial probits for his models. If you dig around hard enough on Google, you can actually find some videos of him speaking about that. And he bragged in a lot of his papers that he was able to see a 15% return on investment, um, you know, sort of during the same time period of on races and such. So I wanted to plot that and see, and for the lower values of lambda, which would imply more covariates being used in the model, uh, we're actually seeing higher returns in Vector, which is kind of nice. The optimal lambda is seven, and it has a holdout return on investment of 36%. Now, I don't expect to get that in real life. I'm sure there's some overfitting going on here. Uh, it doesn't look at drawdown for your actual bankroll and, and stuff like that. It's also a very, very naive betting strategy. Basically, we took the expected value of a bet, and expected value is the probability of the outcome, you know, times the money you would win, Anything with expected value greater than one is a bet you want to make, so we made that bet. There are um, much more interesting betting models. Uh, my favorite, and a lot of people's, is something called the Kelly Criteria, uh, which again, not to get into today, but Google it. There's all you want to know with Wikipedia, has tons of stuff. Um, there's some other things I'd like to explore as well. I'd like to explore the exotic bets, Quinellas, Trifectas, Trios, which are basically uh, betting on outcomes involving two horses. Uh, if you can find the first and the second place winner, you win a lot of money. If you can find any two horses out of the top three, you win a lot of money. If you can bet horses to come in second or third, which means you've got you know, more chances to win and it pays a little less, but the expected value might be better. Um, 
I want to explore something called a quadratic lasso, which is uh, lambda times the sum of beta, as you see here. Um, lots of stuff to do. The big idea of all this is, just to step away from the prediction, once we have probabilities that we're comfortable with, once we have a model that we think predicts fairly well, and we have our covariance, we've done the lasso, and we have our coefficients, everything's tuned up. I think trying to pick one horse to win one race is naive. You don't get rich by you know, one lottery ticket. You want to get rich slowly, to borrow an old phrase. So why not treat the entire day as a portfolio of digital options, in a sense? There's 10 horses in a race, 10 races in a day, for example. So there are 100 win bets. There's 100 uh, place bets, which are second or third place. There's 900 what are called quinella bets, which are picking one and two in order. Um, there's tens of thousands of possible bets through the day. So in a perfect world, you would place some huge combination of bets across that whole grid of options, and the goal is to simply find a reasonable return on investment. I'd much rather tune this thing for a 5% return on investment spread across 1,000 bets throughout the day than try and pick one horse to win one race, because that's not going to happen. But just like the central limit theorem, things will converge if you have enough. Okay, questions? Okay, am I betting this myself right now? Uh, no, betting overseas from the United States is technically illegal, so I'm not actually betting this model right now. Parallelization, did it really help? Yeah, it did, as I mentioned earlier, huge speed up in time was definitely uh, worth the effort because it let me play with lots of tuning parameters for Lambda that I couldn't have done otherwise. Okay, looks like we're about out of time. Any questions, phone numbers here, emails there, websites there, please feel free to contact me at any time. Thank you.